The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, February 8, 2018, and this is the Week in Charts. First of all, I want to thank everybody for being here. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule, and I also appreciate you checking back because we haven't been, we being me, uh, very consistent with uh, doing them once a week just uh, based on what's going on in my personal life. Anyway, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often say, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Now, what are we going to talk about? Well, first of all, obviously current market conditions, and I'll have a lot more to say about that in just one second. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks. Uh, if you don't mind, keep your questions to what's on the slides and then when we get towards the end of the slides, when I'm right before we get to the live charts, and I'll let you know when that is, uh, feel free to ask about other things uh, that aren't uh, necessarily related to what we're discussing. Once we get to the live charts, feel free to ask about as many symbols as, as you want. If you don't mind, hold off until we get to the live charts before you ask for any symbols to be analyzed. And... I will get to them as get to as many as possible. Ask about as many as possible. But if you don't mind, and this is for your benefit, ask about one at a time and hit return. That way, I'll know whether we covered it or not. So, what do we talk about? Well, I don't. Want, I want to do a fairly brief Bitcoin update. There's a lot of developing situations here, and this week's show is going to be nearly all charts. And I know charts and a chart show. Chart show. What a concept. I want to talk about trading opening gap reversals, showing you a recent trade here. And then I want to talk about paying attention to and trading fractal setups. There are some cases where I do actually trade fractal setups, and I'm going to flesh that out in a lot of detail in just one second. And I guess the $64,000 question this week is, is winter here? I've been saying Winter is coming, possibly, for quite some time, but don't worry about that. Be a trend follower, but now we might have to pay attention a little bit. Now, I'm going to flesh out quite a few things on that. In other words, could we be in the early phases of a bear market? Now, that didn't show up earlier, but that's a disclaimer screen. Okay, before we get started, a lot of the concepts I discussed in here or discuss the first four videos of trading full circle if you haven't watched those yet go to my website it's two dash trade dash docs successfully to watch those for free all right now as i said quite a bit my purpose with uh yeah okay it did trigger so we could talk about that stock in a little while absolutely um when I show you these these Bitcoin trades and these cryptocurrency trades, my point is not to show you every trade that I make. Although lately it seems like that's been the case. If you read my new feature, my now column, you'll notice that I did mention this Ethereum trade in there. And then since then, it stopped out. Now, my point is to show that technical analysis works regardless of the market. Now, there are some things to remember. And in some markets are more efficient than others. And I would imagine that these cryptocurrencies are going to become more and more efficient. An efficient market is a market where a lot of people are trading it. Traders tend to cancel each other out often. There's derivatives, which makes it even more complex and hedging and all types of other strategies and applied that can create for choppy markets, and it's very difficult for these very efficient markets to make very large moves over short periods of time. So indices, for instance, can be very efficient. Forex can be very efficient. There are certain things that we can do in these efficient markets to trade them, but our bread and butter is in more inefficient markets or markets that are behaving inefficiently, I should also say, because sometimes efficient markets can behave inefficiently. And as a general statement, I like to short efficient markets more than I like to buy them, and I like to buy inefficient markets 
more than I like to short them. It's very dangerous to go out and short a biotech stock. But like right now, we're starting to see some home builders setting up on the short side. Not that it would be safe to short the home builders, but it might provide an opportunity because a home builder is not going to double the triple overnight and put you in a lot of trouble, more than likely, obviously. But before I digress too far, the point again with showing these cryptocurrency trades is that they behave like any other market and everything you learn here at my website, DaveLander.com, applies such as money management. Now, this is something you've probably never seen from a, and I'll make it a little air quotes, a guru, a losing trade. Yes, this trade did not work. It looked pretty good to me at the time, but it did not work. And if you want to go back and look at prior presentations, I'm sure I talked about previous trades that we took with the trend in this guy and in cryptocurrencies and other cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin. So anyway, as usual, practice sound money management if you're going to trade something and then just trade the normal patterns such as pullbacks, TKOs, etc. OK, now the question is, is Bitcoin dead? Well, it sure looks like the big blue arrow is pointing lower here. And you might be thinking, well, Dave, why not short it? Well, shorting can be a little problematic in these cryptocurrencies, as I've learned, painfully learned. I shorted one a while back, and the cryptocurrency went down. And somehow I got a margin call. So I'm not sure how that all worked out. So it's still a bit of the wild, wild west. So the caveats that I've been talking about quite a bit apply. Don't rush out and put your life savings into these things. But if you want to trade, let's say 2% have stopped out or maybe even 1% have stopped out on a trade when it's set up, then by all means, I think that's uh, possible. Now, one thing interesting just recently happened. One has to wonder if Goldman Sachs just called the bottom in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. So getting back to our Bitcoin screen, a couple days ago, Goldman Sachs says cryptocurrencies are going to zero. Oh, my God. More Goldman, let, me, let, me, let me rewind that. Oh, my God. Goldman Sachs says cryptocurrencies are going to zero. I should rush out and sell all my cryptocurrencies. Well, obviously, I'm being a little tongue-in-cheek. The point is that. Sometimes when you get a news event like this, the reaction is just the opposite. Maybe the slide is already baked into the cake and there might be some initial follow through selling. You notice it did probe lower, but then that selling exhausts itself. Now, I'm not saying rush out and buy cryptocurrencies because Goldman Sachs says they're going to zero. But I want to just point out how silly markets can be and often act opposite of the news or news event like this one so that really should be a big deal that someone as big as goldman sachs is poo-pooing these things and then the market is just shrugging it off so let's pay attention to what happens here i wouldn't rush out and buy them again just yet wait till you have some sort of setup but i do find it interesting it's something that i think we need to watch but dave what does a guy that screens on tv say about bitcoin I have no idea. I mean, geez. <laughs> a friend of mine, Greg Morris, is often asked in, uh, in seminars or whatever, live speaking events, what do you think about that guy who screams on TV? And he basically says, that's what that particular network thinks of you, which I think is just a wonderful way of putting it. So, but I digress. Something easily, I easily do. All right, I want to talk about a trade that I, in some ways, I kind of see as money in the corner with a few caveats. Jimmy Rogers once said that he just waits until he sees money in the corner and then he walks over and picks it up. Now, there's no trade that's ever that safe, but there are certain situations sometimes that set up to where you feel like you just have to take the trade. And a couple of days ago, we had that happen, and I'll flesh that out. So looking at the spiders, we had obviously a serious sell-off 
in the market. Okay, and it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that a drop from there to there, especially after a persistent uptrend, is significant, and this market is severely oversold. Now, you never want to rush out and buy oversold markets. I know that there are some systems out there that that put the put your face in the fire, so to speak, and that's a bad idea because oversold can always become oversold. But a lot of times when you have a severely oversold market, you can use any measurement you want. You could also look at things like the VIX. The VIX went up 95% on that slide in one day, okay? So nearly 100% in one day. I think it was like 400% in four days. We'll take a look at that when we get to the live charts. So you know that there's a bit of fear in this market, a bit of panic. And often, especially when the market closes poorly like this, you often get this exhaustion follow through, at least on the open. Everybody rushes in to, to get out on the open, but often that selling, selling quickly exhausts itself. And many times the market reverses. So to me, I kind of see it as a money in a corner type of trade where you can go in with a fairly small amount of risk and the reward is potentially quite big based on the risk, okay? Now, there's a few caveats I'm going to get to here in just one second. But before we get to that, let's just talk about the trade. And what I'm talking about is an opening gap reversal trade. So when you see the market open, and I like to try to stay on the daily chart. We're going to look at the intraday chart here in just a few minutes. But on the intraday chart, sometimes you can get a little caught up in the zigs and zags where it's a little bit cleaner on a daily chart. So let's take a look at the daily chart first. Here's the open in the spiders. And you can see that there was a tiny bit of dip right after the open. And again, we'll look at the intraday chart. But when it begins to rally, you can come in and buy the market and then put in a fairly tight stop below the low. Now, you don't want to put it right at the low because that low is often retested. And then my favorite thing to do is just kind of close my eyes and then exit market on close. And I actually got out a little bit late because I was busy right around the close and I actually had to take make an after hours trade to get out. But you don't want to carry something like this, a little intraday trade and an intraday position trade is what I call it. I don't want to call it a day trade because my goal is to stay with the position as long as possible. So I call it an intraday position trade as opposed to a day trade. Yes, technically it's a day trade, but I kind of see day trades as kind of going in and out, going in and out, more of a scalping type of thing. Now, let's take a look at the intraday chart on this. And it looks like it did not make it to my slides. Okay. Hang on one second. Talk amongst yourselves. Let's see what happened to it. KDM, KDMN just triggered. Yeah, KDMN is on today's service. It did just trigger. Um, while I'm pulling up the slides, we can take a look at that. Yeah, you can see this is KDMN. This is on the trading service. And it just triggered like a few, about uh, 30 minutes ago, 20 minutes ago. Yeah. Absolutely. Let me see if I had that slide real quick. My apologies. It must have gotten uh, dropped out somehow. Well, I guess this is fodder for next week's show, but I'll talk about uh, next week. I'll bring up the intraday chart. You know what we could do? We could maybe just do that live and then we'll uh, we'll come back to the slides here in one second. So on an intraday basis, we'll take a look at the S&P 500. And we'll take a look at a five-minute chart, if it'll let me go back that far. Let's see. Now, again, you got to be careful on these intraday charts because you can get caught up quite a bit. But my buy was right in here. And you can see we had this opening gap. We had that initial sell-off, but then when it reverses, and let it reverse significantly. Don't just try to 
Don't try to guess the bottom. Make sure it's it's reversed in earnest. You can get you can go long, and again, you can put your stop in right below that low. And I do have a chart somewhere. Maybe it's buried in my slides. And there's a couple of ways to exit. One, you could say, you know what? I think I made enough money in 20 minutes on this trade to where I'm going to go ahead and exit. So you can exit somewhere in here. Or you could do what I like to do, ride out the intraday zigs and zags. And, of course, you could always scale out, too. That's another way of doing it. You can maybe exit half. There's always things you can do in trading. But I find that if I'm watching every zig and zag, I'm going to get really caught up in the trade. I know myself. And before you know it, I'm going to be staring at a screen all day. And I have a lot of things that I need to do other than stare at a screen. I'd recommend you do the same. Do something other than stare at a screen. So instead of doing all that, I just get out market on close, around the close. So you get in early in the day on the reversal, if and only if it reverses, and then you get out on the close. Now, I find it much easier, as I just said, if you're watching a daily chart as opposed to an intraday chart to not get as caught up in the zigs and the zags. All right, let's talk about the fractal nature of patterns. Any questions on opening gap reversals? I know it's something that I've covered quite a bit. Uh, keep in mind, and I think I'm missing a couple slides here, that this is more of an S&G type of trade. You're not going to get rich. This is not a bread and butter type of trade. This is not something you come in and do every day, all day. But when the opportunity presents itself, it's an easy way to jump in and make a little money. Don't bet the farm on these trades. Maybe trade even at a smaller size. And it's just kind of a fun little exercise. It kind of gives you a little bit more experience trading with something that's a little bit outside of the methodology. And you can also use that technique. Let's say you've got a stock that's in a really good trend and has a knockout move. And then the following day, you get a follow through on that knockout. A lot of times you can get a head start on a swing trade with that pattern. Now, I, I kind of hate to say these kind of things because I don't want to encourage you to start day trading, which is a really bad idea. But the point I'm trying to make here is let's say you got a market that's trending nicely. You got a nice TKO move. And your normal entry is here, but let's say this is a pretty serious sell-off and you've got to close down here. The next day it opens down here somewhere. You could either say, okay, I'm going to buy when it takes out the prior day's low or maybe some other sort of intraday entry somewhere in between. And if it rallies all the way back to the close by the end of the day, then you got a head start possibly on a swing trade. Yeah, somebody said you called the ogre and tan the night before. Yeah, that's the other thing, too, I often talk about is thank you for saying that because it turned out to be a bad trade mechanically. But we had a stock that was selling off, and it, it, it sold off hard, and it was nearing that stop. Okay, I'll stop. Let's say it was here. And I said, guys and girls, pay attention because what's going to probably happen is we're going to have some follow-through selling on the open but that might exhaust itself so if you're disciplined pull your stop wait to see if it begins to reverse if it begins to reverse then stay with the trade and if it doesn't reverse go ahead and bail out margin call but yeah sometimes the same technique can be used to actually stay with a trade now Let's talk about the fractal nature of patterns and technical analysis, both from a good standpoint and from a bad standpoint. Now, okay, Dave, what do you mean by the fractal nature of patterns? Well, I believe that you can nest one pattern inside of another. In other words, what works in one time frame works in others. For instance, markets will turn on the hourly chart before they turn on a daily. And I guess you could drill down even further, but it's going to become much more noisier. But they will turn, obviously, on a five minute chart or even a one minute chart or a tick chart if you want to go that far long before they turn on a daily. Now, there's a, 
a good thing with this and there's a bad thing with this. But before we get to that, let me just show you what I mean. If you take a look at the spiders coming off of all-time highs on a one-hour chart, notice that we had a bow tie on the hourly chart, which would have given you a sell signal here. Now, these don't always work out. So that's the caveat I want to throw out to you is that markets might turn on the hourly, but the longer-term trend wins. And as we'll see in one minute, you'll see me looking at weekly charts, okay? And I'm working on a piece for Proactive Magazine, which is due today. I hope I can get it in, and I'll show you some of those slides from that. But I often point out the weekly bow ties, and I'll probably include that in the article because we're at a juncture now where we really need to pay attention. We could be at the start of something much bigger here if this market doesn't go straight back up. But anyway, there's your bow tie on an hourly chart on these spiders. Now, the good thing is intraday turns can help get you aboard a new trend early, and that's the good news. The bad news is, as I alluded to a minute ago, is that you're still fighting a trend at a higher level. OK, and by a higher level, I mean, if you're trading an intraday chart, let's say you're trading an hourly bow tie and it's coming off all time highs. Well, you're fighting that longer term daily trend, just like when you get in on a daily chart, which I prefer trading more often than not, especially in stocks and other inefficient markets, you could still be fighting a longer term weekly trend, especially in something like a transitional pattern, such as a bow tie. Now, let me show you how I like to use these hourly bow ties. Now, before I show you, I'm currently short the euro US dollar. Now, you take a look at the daily chart, you're like, hey, Dave, why are you short this? Well, I'm going to show you. Just be patient. Notice that it made a major new high, and it's in a pretty solid uptrend. Now, you could argue that this could be a nice little swing trade on a daily, and it might be. In an efficient market like Forex, a multi-trillion dollar market where there's a lot of players, as I said earlier, they tend to cancel each other out. So you've got to figure out a way for that efficient market to make an inefficient move and one way that I like and not exactly mechanically but using a little bit of discretion I like to look for an hourly bow tie and then look to short the market now one thing I would caution you or just warn you with with this type of trading is a lot of times it's like beating your head against the wall it feels so good when you quit you might be wrong three times in a row before you catch a good trend that pays for everything. And it's really hard to take that third trade and maybe even that fourth trade after this thing hits a new high and begins to roll over a little bit. So that's a bit of a caveat there that you are still fighting that longer term trend. So that's a downside in trading something like this, trading an efficient market, looking for an inefficiency with something like a fractal pattern like a bow tie but sometimes and i've been short for quite a while on this one because that bow tie will turn obviously on the hourly chart long before it does on the daily and you can see the daily is now beginning to turn on that one now here's a slide that i left in and i added a question mark to it and I've been talking about this for quite a while. There's a lot of fear mongering out there. And I've been saying, okay, yeah, winter's coming. Sooner or later, this party's going to end, but not just yet. But now, especially given the light of this morning's action combined with recent action, I might be willing to question that a little bit. So I said, in the meantime, remain a trend following moron. Well, that doesn't mean throw caution to the wind. Make sure you're honoring your stops. Make sure you really like a new setup on the long side. But now might be the time to start 
dusting off your shorts and start thinking about doing a little shorting. Now, I don't have today's data in this chart, but if we take a look at the daily S&P 500, you could see that the EMAs and now the 10 SMA, for those keeping score, in case you guys aren't familiar with this, when you see three moving averages on my chart, these are what I call my bow tie moving averages. And this is a 30 EMA. This is a 20 EMA. And the blue line is a 10 SMA, simple moving average. One thing cool about ex exponential moving averages, and I'm pretty sure I covered it in the first four videos of Trading Full Circle, so watch those, as I mentioned earlier, is that when the price crosses below the moving average, an exponential moving average, that is, the moving average will turn down. I learned that from Greg Morris. I discover things empirically quite often, and then later on I find out there's some mathematics behind it. Empirically meaning, I just that's a fancy word for saying, I just like to look at charts. Now, it's hard to see, but this if you take this moving average on this day here and you go back one day, it is, believe it or not, actually lower. This will work for any period moving average. Even a 200-day EMA will turn down when the price crosses through it. Again, it's mathematics. It's a little bit more exacerbated in the 20-day. You can see the turn down. Let me just take my ink off so you can see it. The turn down there is a little bit more obvious. Now, the 10 also turned, but you'll notice that the 10 still had a little lag in it. It was still actually headed higher even though we had one, two, three closes below it. Now, I spent a lot of time talking about lag and drop-off effect and things like this and EMA crossings and trading full circle. So I'm not going to reinvent the wheel here, but just know that a simple moving average will have a little bit more lag. I do like a 10-day simple because it gives me a true representation of price. But as we move further out in the time horizon, I tend to prefer an exponential moving average. Now, I'm going to show you in one minute. I do also pay attention to something like the 50-day simple and a 50-day, 50-week simple moving average, too. That's also kind of something that's a, a little neat. It's a little slow to turn, but it, it can really help you keep focused on your longer-term trend following. And I'll get to that in just one second. Okay, it's been a second. <laughs> There's our 50-day moving average in case Phil's paying attention. And you can see that we did drop below it. And notice that it's still headed higher. Remember, this is a simple moving average, but it's well-watched. So sometimes anything well-watched is worth watching. One of my concerns is when you have a thrust down like this, this will be your first thrust, and then a higher high and a higher low. That actually sets up a first thrust sell signal. And my concern was that this market doesn't go straight back up, then we could have some problems. Let's not panic just yet, but let's pay attention. Now, let's talk about Dave Light or Daylight. Now, this was a graphic that I used for a Proactive Trader Magazine article that I did a few months back. And I'm going to update it and use it again in, in today's uh, submission. What I've done here is the green in here is upside daylight. And that means that the low of the market, as you can see here, is greater than the moving average. So everything in green is upside daylight. And this is a 50-week moving average here, simple, okay? But you can see, except for a few bad days, most of the 90s, especially the late 90s, you had upside daylight on a weekly. Now, what happened in 2000? Well, we had a bow tie down, which I didn't get around to putting in today, but it'll probably be in an oracle later today. But we had a bow tie down, and we also had a moving average crossing with a lot of downside daylight, everything in red. In fact, it stayed red until when? Well, for all intents and purposes, pretty much the end of that bear market, okay? 
And then what's fascinating is, I don't think there's any red in here anywhere. Maybe one day back here, but you have to really squint your eyes. This whole bull market, you had green. So that in and of itself is a pretty cool signal to help keep you on the right side of the market. Well, what happened in 2008? Well, in case you were living under the rock, we had a bear market, okay? And notice that we had all this red downside daylight that stayed there for a long, long time. Now, it was a little late to turn, and you see you still have some lag. You can see that this moving average is still headed down. So it would be fun to use an exponential moving average for this exercise. The only thing I caution you is you would get a lot more signals, and some of those signals would be false signals. So the more lag you have, the less likely you are to have false signals, but the later you will be to the party. And then I suppose if a market really began to crash in earnest, your signal would come much later. And that's just a trade-off. That's trading. If there was a way... That was always guaranteed results, and I, and I found that you'd never see my fat ass again. Instead, I'm here grinding it out day after day after day. Anyway, in the greatest bull run in history that we are in now, I'm pretty sure it is. I don't have to check with someone like uh, Tom McClellan to see, somebody who keeps all those stats. But I think this is one of the greatest bull runs in history. You could see we didn't have very much downside daylight in this entire run so far. And you don't want to trade this in and of itself, but you want to use it as something to kind of make you pay attention. So you don't want to rush out and sell and short like a madman when you have a little bit of this red to the downside. But you do want to honor your stops just in case. And you could see that if you were following along a couple years ago, I got a little bearish right in here because we had a little bit of this downside daylight. And on top of that, we had some other signals. In fact, I think we had a Russell 2000 bow tie down on the weekly. Just notice that IWM has a bow tie down. Yeah, we're going to get to that in the live charts, but uh, good, good eye on that. So, again, this chart's a little bit dated. But you can see we've had a lot of green going all the way back to 2009 and not a whole lot of red based on this little daylight indicator. Now let's fast forward to the weekly chart on the S&P 500. And this is a 50-week moving average here. And you can see that, and right here this is actually just that if you squint your eyes, it, you can see that it didn't even touch the moving average right here. Okay. So you've had upside daylight. You had one little kiss right here. But you've had upside daylight all the way going back to the middle of 2016 in this last run. And so far, we still have some daylight left between where we are and the moving average. So again, you're going to be a little late. You're going to be a little late to the party when the trend starts. And you're going to overstay your welcome when the trend ends. That's just trend following. I talked with a client a couple days ago and he was wondering what to do in Apple and he got in at way, 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 way lower levels and he was a little bummed out that he gave up that hunk of change recently and it's like, well, you caught a pretty damn good trend. You had a pretty good ride. Don't beat yourself up. Just enjoy that money and now you've got a tax problem. Run out and pay your taxes on your money. And that's fine. All right. <laughs> Preacher Dave, please use Dave Light. Don't switch back and forth. Okay, we'll call it Dave Light. Thank you. My slide's got... Um, Exited on accident. Let me get back to where we were. Deja vu all over again. Oops, what's going on? Okay. All right, I think that's a... Uh, I thought I had some in slides in here, but evidently not. 
All right, let's hop out to the let's take let's hop out to the live charts and let's flesh some of these things out. Yeah, we'll get to that in one second. That's a good point. Good point. All right. Let's start with the P's. Now, here's what concerns me. And again, you want to take things one day at a time. This is a first thrust down. If you read the layman's guide to trading stocks, you'll see I discuss this pattern in there. Also, it's in trading full circle, obviously. And step one is a big thrust down relative to the normal volatility. Okay. So a 10% move in a biotech stock might happen in one afternoon, okay? Let's see what this move is, by the way. So this move here is how many percent? Okay, so that's almost an 8% move. That's significant based on a normal volatility of a market, okay? And I'm actually working with a major charting package to try to define some of these patterns of mine. And uh, that's one of the things we're trying to figure out. How are we going to define what a first thrust is? See, I like to eyeball it. To me, I could just eyeball this and say, hey, you know what? That's a first thrust. But the computer needs some specific instructions. But anyway, I think it's safe to say that's a significant thrust down, okay, measured from high to low. It's probably about 10% high to low. And then you have you need a higher high and a higher low. So based on this pattern, you would be short as of this morning, the S&P 500 on a daily chart. Now, if we back out to a weekly chart, what did I just say? You're going to get a sell signal on a lower time frame, just like we're in an hourly sell for a couple of weeks here or however long it's been. And then now we're in a daily sell, okay? And let's go up to the weekly chart. And so far in a weekly chart, to me, this just looks like, looks like a trend knockout. So... If we take out the top of this bar, then I think we're okay, all right? But if we take out the bottom of this bar, then the market could be in trouble, okay? And then also, let's get back to the Dave light and put in a 50-day moving average, which in this case would be a 50-week moving average. That would mean 2,500 could be an area where we want to become concerned. Not necessarily go crazy bearish when that happens, but an area to be concerned. So I think the whole long-winded thing that I'm trying to say here is you want to pay attention to all of these things just in case we could be in the early phases of the market turning. Now let's take a look at the NASDAQ, a couple other things, and then if you guys want to start asking my individual questions, feel free to do so now. I'll go ahead and open it up while I finish up this market analysis. Pretty much everything I said for the... NASDAQ or the S&P, I should say, applies to the uh, NASDAQ. You can see thrust down, higher, high, higher, low. You would have had a trigger this morning on that first thrust signal. This is the 50-day moving average. Nothing magical about it, okay? It's not a line in the sand, but it can help to give you a good reference. Now, let's take a look at the weekly here. And I also want to go back and look at the daily bow ties. On a weekly basis, we still have plenty of day light, okay? And then zoom in a little bit, and you can see the low has a long ways to go to take out that 50-week moving average. So like the P's, if we take out the top of this weekly trend knockout, again, it's a fractal. It's fractal, right? What happens on an intraday chart happens on a daily chart, happens on a weekly chart, or vice versa, okay? Kind of like the Russian doll analogy I often speak of. So that's what's happening in the NASDAQ. Now, let's just go back to the S&P 500 real quick. And let's take a look at the bow ties there. Now, as I often say, you'll get a first thrust in a sharp move like this quicker than you will get a bow tie. A bow tie is designed to catch a more gradual rollover, but you still need to pay attention to them. That's one reason, not to digress too far, but that's one reason why I like the waiting for the bow tie more often than not. I, I do apply a little discretion, but when I'm trading Forex, I like waiting for that hourly bow tie because you'll get a lot of false signals before that moving average actually crosses. And the moving average has a little lag to it, and you're more likely to get a bona fide signal. Unfortunately, when a market begins to move really fast, you have to go with the first thrust first 
because otherwise, by the time moving averages cross, they'll have so much lag in them that you'll miss the crux of the trend. And that's a whole other presentation, but you get the idea. You could see that these EMAs and even the SMA have turned down significantly and are on the cusp of crossing. So we could get a daily bow tie happening in the P's. Obviously, NASDAQ, same sort of pattern, very similar to the P's. And then finally, IWM, as somebody pointed out, we now have a bow tie in the IWM. Now, here's kind of a little... Uh, tricky thing. Technically, you would need a higher high and a higher low in order to short the market, okay? Because step one, the moving averages must completely cross over, which would happen today based on, looks like, you know, if we close anywhere in here, if we go higher, then maybe they won't be completely crossed over. So again, your first thrust would be triggering now. A bow tie might trigger and set up sometimes in the future. You would still need a higher high and a higher low for that bow tie to set up. So always look for first thrust first if you're looking to actually short a market. But do pay attention to this bow tie situation. Let's take a look at a weekly in the Russell 2000. The weekly is not quite as impressive as the NASDAQ. And the S&P, uh, it's a little concerning that on a weekly, we did come down all the way to tag this prior little peak in here. Let's clean this chart up and throw in a 50-day moving average, and then we'll put in a 50-week moving average. You can see the 50-day moving average, and this is a simple moving average, okay, has already turned down. And it's, it usually takes a while for a moving average to turn down. And that's because the reason it's turned down is because of the drop-off effect we are adding in lower prices and taking off higher prices okay so that's making that moving average turn pretty quick and that's pretty cool to see that 50 is already turning on that okay not necessarily happy about it it's just something cool you know being something cool and happy about it two different things now notice on the weekly chart we have pretty much decent daylight i think we had one little kiss right here but we had decent i said daylight dave light we had decent dave light going all the way back to 2016. So, so far, a decent little trend remains intact. But out of all the indices, the rusty does look the worst. Obviously, if we take out 153, let's say 60, then all bets are off. We bet we're back to longer-term trend-following mode. Right now, you want to be cautious. So I guess the point is, don't freak out, but pay careful attention to what's going on because the situation is beginning to worsen. Now, let's take a look at bonds real quick. We're almost done, so if you guys want to keep asking about individual stocks, keep on doing that. Let's take a look at uh, the dollar first. So the dollar, as you can see, is headed higher so far, okay? Let's, uh, just for S&Gs, based on this ETF, I'm just kind of curious myself. Let's see what's happening on an hourly bow tie. Because you're like, hey, Dave, that, that chart's headed lower. Why would you be why would you be long? Well, because I'm trading an hourly pattern against the euro, or the euro versus the dollar, I should say. And lo and behold, we do have an hourly bow tie in the dollar. And that little rally in the dollar has been putting a little pressure on commodities. By the way, I just slipped in a little into market technical analysis. Strong dollar, weak commodities. Well, Dave, can you always trade that? Not necessarily. Sometimes you have long lead and lag times. I just updated the books on my website, books to read. So if you get a chance, check that out and then read, of course, John Murphy's Intermarket Technical Analysis. Intermarket Technical Analysis only matters when it matters. And if you go to my website and you get those books to read, you'll see that I actually wrote about that. So it's something good to have good knowledge to have, but don't try, don't try to apply it all the time. Just kind of stow it away. It only matters again when it matters. So that's what's going on with the dollar. Let's take a look at bonds real quick before I forget. Bonds are kind of interesting. I've been saying for a while now that I think we're going to come down and challenge these 2017 lows, and then looks like we almost got there today for all intents and purposes. As I preach with bonds, it's not the absolute level of bonds. 
it's the delta in bonds that tends to spook the market. So if you have a big slide over a short period of time, the market tends to get a little spooked. Okay. If the market kind of the market being bonds kind of gradually works its way lower, then the market doesn't get spooked. Okay. So it's not the absolute levels. And I know there's some systems out there that try to go off absolute levels. And I just think that's um, BS. It doesn't work that way. Okay, Beatrice. Let's take a look at the major MIGs real quick. And we'll uh, keep those questions coming. We're going to, yeah, good, a lot of good market questions. Yeah, keep those coming. Let me just get through these major MIGs before I forget. And uh, we'll get right to those. We should have plenty of time today. So if you look at some of these major MIGs, you can see that a lot are beginning to take on the appearance of the overall market. Okay, and in some situations, some of them are getting kind of ugly. You can see we're getting a bow tie down in hardware, software not yet. Uh, there's a couple in here, such as drugs, that are looking pretty ugly. And you can see they'd really have to put in a serious rally to get back to their old highs. And semiconductors, you can see, are nearing a bow tie down. And let's take a look at where they are to where they were. They're nearing their December lows in here. So that would be a little bit of concern. So as you go through these sectors, I've been a bull on energy stocks. I've been trying to get on board energy stocks, and I failed miserably. Okay. And now energies are beginning to implode a little bit in here. It could actually bow tie down soon. Uh, financials, I don't like to use these financials, so let's take a look at XLF. The reason I don't like to use those financials is they're more of a representation of a lot of ETFs that are financially related, but a lot of them are like indexes and things like that, index ETFs. So it doesn't really give you a good, true picture. But if you look at the financial spiders, you can see it looks a lot like everything else. Okay, first thrust, potential bow tie into works, first thrust triggering today. What else? Uh, materials and construction, as you can see, beginning to break down a little bit. We're starting to see some shorts in the home builders. Uh, metals and mining, one of the better looking sectors on a relative strength basis, and I'm still kind of bullish on metals and mining, but with the caveat that we better see a rally soon, and if you're going to go after any, make sure you wait for an entry. We have one on the radar coming into today. Now, some of these interest rate sensitive areas, such as real estate and utilities, have already been taken out to the woodshed and beaten, as you could see. And sometimes it's kind of ironic. You'll actually see a rally in some of these beaten up areas when the market itself begins to tank. Okay. For s and can you put the 50? Put it at 50 on S&P 500? You know, for some reason, I'm not seeing anybody's name today. Did it ask for your name when you uh, when you registered? I got I got to I got to have somebody walk through the registration process and figure out what's going on. Yeah, we used to have like a thousand or more registered. Now we're only getting a few hundred in here. We got to figure out what's going on. Uh, S&P 500. You want the 50-day moving average in the S&P 500? I'm sure we can do that again. Okay. All right. Now you have a question on that. Uh, you can see again S&P. It's Craig. Okay. The 50. All right. Here's the 50-day moving average. And then um, what was your question on that, Craig? You just want to look at it or? Just absolute levels, okay? Yeah, and usually um, usually a moving average will correspond with a little support, and you can see, well, we really didn't have that much support in here on that. But sometimes a moving average, you go back in time, you'll see a big base or something right around when that moving average is. The 50 is well followed. Yeah, that's the reason why I look at the 50, but it only matters what it matters. It's like Phil, I know in here – who often attends these shows, he's a big fan of the 50, and he does a little work around that 50-day moving average. He likes to retrace instead of 50, and then he gets back on the trend or gets on the trend, whatever the case may be. And then every now and then he'll see me using it, and he thinks, like, hey, did I just influence you to use that 50? It's like, no, it's when the market begins to tank, I begin worrying about the 50-day moving average. As a general statement, I don't plot it until the market is in some sort of trouble or in a downtrend, I don't plot it until we begin to see some rally off of lows. I like to know where we are just because it's a well-watched indicator. 
Yeah, it's the first firewall, then the 200. Ah, good point. Um, no name. <laughs> I don't know where everybody's names have gone. Uh, but let's add it. Let's add in a 200 since we have a little time today, and see where that puts us. We need a pretty color. What, what color you guys want? How about how about red? Okay. So the point is that uh, it's the first firewall, and then the next would be the 200. The 200 is about 2550, which doesn't look that far away. Now, let's see if we have any corresponding support around the 250. Not really. Usually, a lot of times, you'll have like a base. See how we have this base here? Usually, that base will equal the moving average. But in this particular case, we don't. So, yeah, 2,500. Let's see, 2,550. Sure, that, that could be definitely possible here. And every now and then, even in great bull trends, as you can see, let's take that 50 out. You do come down and you kiss that. 200 day moving average. Not that it's a line in the sand, okay, but it pays to pay attention. A bear market can't really start in earnest until you get below the 200, I suppose. I mean, I guess the drop from there to, to the 200 is quite a ways. But let's back the chart out a little bit. That's as far as it'll go. But you can see the Dave Light at the 200 day moving average has been there for all intents and purposes ever since. The middle of 2016 and we only had some ugliness into 2015 or middle 2015 and, and in 2016 now around these times you probably saw me get a little bearish because i was getting a little nervous about the markets and then they went back up but that's what a trend follower does a good little trend follower he's willing to get taken out and then reshelf his ego if that's a word is that a way to do this does that make sense Anyway, put his ego aside maybe and then get back in and follow the trend. 50 cross, 200 is a death cross. Yeah, uh, we talked about that quite a bit. If you go to my YouTube channel and do a search on death cross uh, on my channel, you'll find quite a few presentations on that. Is it a bear, a 20% correction? Craig, no name. Yeah. Uh, that's the media's definition, okay? And then uh, that's the point I was making with the Russell 2000. When I got a little bearish a while back on the Russell, and we had a bow tie down, and it didn't turn into a major bear market, but it did drop. How far did it drop? A little further than that. It was 10%. I'm trying to – oh, peak the trough. It dropped significantly. Who let the dogs out? Uh, so for all intents and purposes, we had a bear market in the Russell 2000 based on the media's metrics, okay? And uh, the, But the, you only got about 10% of that, I think, out of the bow tie itself. So that was still a signal that was worth paying attention to on a weekly basis. I mean, that's still a pretty significant drop. So it pays to pay attention to these weekly bow ties. Fly equals fly. We take all signals. Yeah, uh, Greg Morris, we take all signals seriously, you know. Uh, and, yeah, I've done quite a few presents. In fact, I just uh, if you look at the books to read, I talked about you always get something good out of Greg. And he says we take all signals as if it will be the big one. And his point last time he visited me when we started talking about him, I, I told him talking about that. I told him that I often quote him, and again, you get so much good wisdom out of him. So read his book while you're at it, too, which is on that Books to Read page. But he said that whipsaws are frustrating, bear markets are devastating. You could survive frustration, okay, but not devastation, obviously. So good to know. Missing links. Very difficult to log in, but wouldn't miss the show. Finally got to work at 1052. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure what's going on because, yeah, we definitely don't have – it seems like the people here are those uh, – the regulars, and they figured out a way to get in. So my apologies on that. I guess I'm apologizing to people who got in. doesn't make sense. My apologies to those who couldn't get in. Please email me. If, you, if you're watching a recording of this and you couldn't get in, 
uh, please let me know what you did so we could solve that. It seems like after we, I ran out of shows because I forgot to add him in when I got uh, busy with life. And when we started using new links, everything just kind of um, went to hell. Okay, yeah, we'll come back to that one, Dennis. Uh, I wanted to talk about the VIX real quick before I forget. Um, the VIX had a run of, and I guess peaked the trough even more, but it went up 100% just the other day. And then we had a spike up on that reversal day. And usually when that happens, such an extreme spike. And then years ago, I actually wrote some systems uh, based on um, being influenced by some of Larry Connor's work, which found its way into Larry's work, Larry's books, and then uh, one of my books. But I don't, I don't use the VIX as much anymore. To me, it's kind of like the intermarket technical analysis. It only matters when it matters, but it's good to know. Um. <laughs> Somebody was joking about me and said, you know, he gets up there all folksy like, oh, I'm just a trend follow moron, but then knows everything. Well, that was a very nice compliment. But I do, just because I've done this a while, I've picked up on a lot of these little things like VIX and all these other concepts and in opening gap reversals. I don't try to use them every day in everything I do, but it just helps to know some of these things to kind of fill in some of the missing pieces. You got to be careful, though, you don't end up with like an analysis paralysis. So that's the VIX, uh, XIV blow up, XIV. Yeah, you know, be really careful in, in things that you don't understand or not that you don't understand and that, that are a lot more complicated than they appear on the surface. Okay, like the XIV, this is a derivative of the derivative of the derivative and it's an inverse on top of that, you know. These these a lot of these VIX shares are based on futures markets, and that because of uh, the decay that you have in a futures contract, it gets really tricky, tricky, tricky on these things. So I would avoid them at all costs. But yeah, look at that blow up in that. That's kind of interesting. Did not hold that, but could have. I was not fully aware of the magnitude of that risk. No more volatility, EF, ETFs, ETNs for me. Well, if you know what you're doing, it, you know, if you know the nature of the beast, it's okay. But this is a wonderful example of what can happen when you don't fully understand the instrument that you're dealing with, okay? I actually recommended it wasn't the VIX shares. It was uh, I think it was natural gas or something once for an institutional project. And I got ripped a new one because of the the guy telling me I was picking up nickels in front of a bulldozer. And he was right. But as a technician, I saw the setup and I submitted it to the project. But, yeah, in hindsight, it was the wrong thing to do. Um but yeah, be careful. These ETNs, um, exchange, electronic traded note, exchange, I, I don't even know. This. Exchange traded note, electronic traded note. The notes are even worse on, on these things because it's not actually a real thing. It's something that's created from something else. Printing money, then systematic risk, clearing XIV, reason for crash. Uh, I don't know what the reason for the crash was, but the VIX went up 100%. And if this is the inverse VIX, so I don't know what that move lower was. Let's measure it from the crash day. Let's just look at that. Let's see. Yeah, 94%. Well, the VIX went up 100%. This went down 94%. It's inversed. I guess that's what it's supposed to do, right? For once, it actually did what it's supposed to do. But uh, the world is not as simple as it might look on the surface. VIX 10 to 50. Yeah, that's a pretty big move. That's what, 400%? Okay. We've got a couple more market questions, and then we'll hop into the uh, individual stocks. So keep asking about stocks. Looking at the 126 close, the 26 low yesterday, high 50% retracement on DJI, just shy of 50% on SPX. All right, let's take a look at that. I'm not a huge fan of retracements, but sometimes I'll take a look at them, and sometimes I'll actually make a measurement. So looking at the 126 close, 
All right. And the 2.6 low. Okay. 50% retracement. All right. Let's measure that. I don't know. Does this have a 50% in it? Yeah, thereabouts. If somebody, did you do the math, the actual math? That's kind of interesting. Yeah, it stalled out about 50%. I do have a pattern called a gatekeeper that actually sort of uses retracements, and then that could actually play out if we were to have the mother of all rallies and then stall out, but that doesn't look like it's going to happen anytime soon. Interesting point. Yeah, I didn't I didn't even realize that was 50%. Uh, I'm guessing this is 50% in telechart. Does anybody know for a fact? Okay, Dennis wants to know about USAK. On a pullback, possibly. You know, my only problem here, you've got this big gap and this big wide range bar, and then now it's just kind of drifting in here. I would much prefer something that it had, had maybe in a gradual uptrend and then accelerated higher as opposed to just kind of like a shot higher. It's also super duper thin. It only traded uh, not even 50,000 shares today. So I think I'm going to pass on that one. Regions Financial, that's probably going to look more like a short than a long RF. Um, You know what? It's not too bad. Let me take that back. I just assume it would look like the rest of the banks. It looks okay. Um, you know, let's check back at the end of the day and see what the market did, what the banks did. Is it worth going after something now? I felt a little bit more constructive on the markets coming into the day than I do right now. And that's why you got to be careful not to make too many predictions. You kind of have to wait until things shake out, maybe at the end of the day. But the way I feel now, and again, check back often, I might not feel as constructive about things. Obviously, today is an interesting piece. Uh, yesterday, we stalled out a little bit. That was a little concerning. And now today, a little downside follow-through is concerning, too. But with all that said, uh, I'd almost like to see a tiny bit more knockout. It is a, a double-top knockout-looking type of pattern. So it's pretty good. I, I'm impressed that you found a stock that looks like this, given the nature of this market. But you definitely want to wait for an entry, and maybe that in and of itself will keep you out of trouble on that one. Yep, 50% retracement. That's cool. That's I, did, I didn't know that. I didn't. Uh, usually, I'm pretty good at eyeballing these things, and I, I really didn't think it was that much. That's uh, awesome. Cool. Okay, we talked about that one. All right. What? Um, any more stocks you guys want to talk about? We got plenty enough time today. I guess that's one good thing, locking everybody out. Those who make it can ask what they want. <laughs> I appreciate you going to jump through the hoops to get there. All right, this is a biotechnology. It's an IPO. Um, one way to trade IPOs, as I've discussed, and this hasn't actually made it into the IPO course, but it will whenever I redo the course, is to buy the IPO when you have – Dave Light, and it closes at a new closing high. So your buy on this one would have been on this day here. Now, in general, I prefer a lower-priced IPO, but this Dave Light pattern does seem to test out, or work, I should say, in um, higher-priced IPOs when they start making brand-new highs. So uh, I would wait for the next pullback now. I think it's a little late to jump in midstream, but good eye on that one. How about Tesla? Okay. Somebody emailed me yesterday. It's one Tesla. He won't have to pay the warning on. I'm going to have to go watch a launch at some point in time. I have a, a distant family member that actually works with the organization. Well, it's just kind of wide and loose and all over the place. Um, there's nothing for me here. You know, this is where you got to do the net-net test. Okay, where was it back in October? 3.30. Where is it now? 3.30. Okay. So as a trend follower, there's nothing for me there. Um, you know, maybe it's a top, but it's kind of wide and loose and all over the place. There's nothing. 
It's the landing of the boosters that was impressive. Yeah, that's what um that's what he told me. He said, "Don't come for a launch, come for the landing," which I thought was interesting. I like to see both. I used to be an amateur rocket scientist. I have the uh, unofficial record of the largest rocket ever launched in the state of Louisiana. A little trivia for you there. Um, this one has caught my eye, and I like it. The only problem is it does have some problems way back in time. Now, maybe all that trading, all that problems has uh, washed its way through the system. Uh, it's had such an extreme run in here. I'd like to see a little bit more deeper pullback than what we've seen so far. But, yeah, it's good eye on that one. It, it's sort of straightened its act up, or it's gotten its act together, I should say. It looks pretty good. But I'd actually like to see a little bit deeper pullback on that one before uh, going after it. Okay, a lot of people asking about the same stock. Good eye. Shutterfly, SFLY. Uh, it's another one of those gap, huge gap things. Uh, when you have a huge gap like this, usually it's hard to get in after the gap. And my methodology is not a be-all, catch-all. This stock's kind of all over the place, okay? It tends to trade in chunks. And those type of stocks, even if they go higher, are hard for me to get on. And, you know, there's an old saying, I guess, unless you're Harvey Weinstein, you can't kiss all the women, and even he can't do that, right? So, uh... I would pass on that one and look for something else. Snap joke, still crap. Well, eh. I guess technically it uh, did uh, trigger some patterns, but it's a, it's a little bit too extreme in the gap. Okay. Um, you know, it, it wasn't crap for a day, if that's what you're asking. But you can see that Snapchat just kind of came public and just imploded in here. And this was our poster child for waiting for follow through and then of course something happens and it just makes what 50% move overnight uh, I would leave it alone it's just too much too much too much too fast in this and then it's already trading off those levels as you can see and we'll cover that one somebody asked is either 10 of you asking about the same stock or one of you asking over and over <laughs> Armo, A R M O. Yeah, we talked about that one. Yeah, KDMN is uh, one we're along uh, as of this morning. I think I just got triggered in this one. Um, if you didn't take the initial entry, then right above this high would be a good uh, good place to get in. I would have preferred a little bit deeper pullback, but I did like the way it came out of this base in, in the longer term trend. And on top of all that, longer term looks like a big picture bottom. They've kind of gotten their act together. So, yeah, absolutely. Put your best clients in it. <laughs> I guess I need to throw a disclaimer up, huh? All information is for educational purposes only. Dave Landry and Cynthia Trading LLC is not a registered investment advisor. I was a CTA for 14 years, but I'm no longer registered as anything. So, all right, any more questions? Going once, going twice. Well, all right. Obviously, I want to thank everybody for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I appreciate it. And thank you guys for jumping through the hoops to get here. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on, but hopefully we can debug that. If one of you guys or a couple of you guys want to help me out, I appreciate that so we can figure out what's happening. Uh, but, yeah, just let me know what your experience has been on that. Anyway, again, thanks, everybody, for being here. I'm not sure when the next show will be. Everything is up in the air at this time. Um, at my second office, I don't have the audio equipment set up or proper audio equipment and soundproofing and all. So I need to decide on whether or not I'm going to do shows from there. Plus, there's a lot of um, complications going on there, too. So uh, not anything I want to get into at this moment. But anyway, thank you guys so much. Everybody have a great weekend. If we're going to talk to you now and then. And I guess uh, I'll see you uh, next time. Thank you so much.